Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 24 of our series on La Morte d'Arthur. As we are actually, well, we'll see if we get all the way through the end of my, uh, my plans for the day. I have a rather ambitious number of slides today. But if we do get through it all, then we will actually finish the story of Sir Tristram. Well, not that it's finished when we get there, but uh, finish uh, the story of Sir Tristram and Sir Palamides pretty much as far as we're going to get it. Um, because after this, we're going to shift back to Lancelot and then the quest for the Holy Grail, and we are hurtling towards the ending of the story at that point. That is the, 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 the final turn into the home stretch there. Anyway, very excited about that. Now, look, just a couple quick announcements first. Uh, so first, uh, uh, the spring semester has started at Signum. It's been fun hearing from some of our students about their first week of classes so far. Uh, that's been really great. So uh, if you if you were thinking maybe of auditing one of our classes or something like that, there's still time. Uh, you can join still up through the end of the second week. So that's through next week. You can still uh, sign up for classes, though again, it gets kind of harder and you get further and further behind, of course, as we move forward. But uh, uh, so now's the time, definitely. But there's still it's still theoretically possible if you wanted to join um, that so that's one thing the second thing of course I'm going to text moot in just a couple days I will be there two days from now uh, so I'm very excited to go down and see everybody and I mean everybody it's gonna be an enormous turnout down at text moot uh, one of the biggest events Signum has ever done for uh, uh, not only biggest regional event ever one of our biggest events full stop so um, I'm uh, really excited hope to see some of you uh, down there uh, in Texas this week. It shouldn't, of course, our Wednesday night classes, it shouldn't disrupt anything. I'll be back next Wednesday like normal. But I did want to say, uh, if you, if any of you were still thinking of joining us at TexMoot, registration is closed, of course, but we do still, I think, uh, have some extra tickets that we uh, set aside uh, just in case. So um, if... Uh, yeah, so, so it's still theoretically possible. Uh, just send us an email and we'll help you get things sorted out there. Um, but anyway, so if you're, if you're anywhere around Texas, we're going to be in Waco uh, this coming weekend. You can, of course, see all the details at textmoot.org. Um, but um, anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing folks down there. It's going to be great fun. So that's, oh, and I should mention, a lot of people have been asking about MythMoot. Mythmood is totally happening. We've had a little bit of a delay. We've been working out some things with the venue, so we're trying to iron a couple things out there, which is why we've, we're, we're opening registration later than we have the last couple years. Um, so be patient. We're still looking at the last weekend in June as our dates, the 27th through the 30th of June, uh, are the dates that we're looking at. Um, uh, it should be. It looks like a great program this year. I think it's, everything's going to be great. We just we haven't been able to uh, 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 open the registration yet because we still are ironing out a last few details. Hopefully, um, will be uh, sorted out. Is uh, Arthur? It's going to be in the same place. Uh, that we're looking at the same location. Uh, assuming we're able to iron things out, it will be at the same location. So. And yes, Stephen, Nader Moot registration should open soon. Uh, that is uh, uh, that is definitely one of the next things. We've got a couple more regional moots coming up uh, in the f in the uh, the rest of the first half of 2019, which we're gonna which we're gonna open up soon. So anyway, um, that's uh, and uh, Tom, there is no doubt about the dates as of now. We I don't see any reason to think we're gonna change the dates. So 27th through the 30th uh, is is a is a barring some very unforeseen catastrophe that's uh that's pretty firm uh so no that's quite firm uh, <laughs> let, let me be less dubious about that um yeah yeah so that should be good okay good like i said i know lots of people have lots of questions about that so we'll um uh we will we will move forward and i'll get back with some more when i come back from texas i'm kind of I've got Texas in the last things in a whole, you know, goodness. I've been so buried in bureaucracy, which like rots your brain. I mean, it really does. Uh, so I, I, that's what I've like, it's been my life for the last month uh, is uh, I feel like I've, I'm, I, I've been feeling like uh, rather like Heracles, you know, with the Hydra, you know, except I haven't had anyone to hand me the torches, you know, so I, it's just been, 
uh, it's kind of the my my feeling about the experience of trying to deal with federal and state bureaucracy. So, anyway, um, I'm gonna there's something I'm trying to finish up there finally, if I can cut the final heads off, and then uh, we'll uh, and then we got tax mood coming up, and then I'll be regrouping and and I'll do some more announcements about uh, the road ahead here over the next four months or so, as far as our next events are concerned. So, that's what I'm going to do. But today we are going to go back to the tale of Sir Palamides because I've been talking about Sir Palamides and uh, really emphasizing him and we have seen his issues with envy, uh, right? And uh, I think uh, I love this section, the tournament at Lana Zepp uh, and the sort of immediate aftermath of the tournament at Lana Zepp um, is I, I, one of my favorite parts uh, of all of Lamort d'Arthur. And in particular, I love his handling, his treatment of Sir Palamides. Um, the uh, it is it is a, a in some ways, of course, my my attachment to it is is sort of medieval, uh, you know, because I really like medieval literature and um, have developed a, a medieval's taste uh, for moral pageantry um, and the way that uh, I, it's funny. I almost accidentally said Spencer right now, partly because we were talking about Spencer last night, um, uh, but also because it actually reminds me, uh, Mallory's subtlety of d sort of thinking through and depicting the psychological drama of somebody who is wrestling with like a serious moral problem, um, you know, who is trying and not really succeeding to overcome a particular moral failing and looking at what are the consequences for that person? How does that manifest itself? And what is attached to that? Um, he does a really interesting and sensitive job. Um, uh, Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen is a wonderful, wonderful moral allegory um, and very, very thoughtful in looking at various different elements of, uh, of you know, sort of, late medieval, early Renaissance um, uh, morality there. But Mallory's job that he does here with Sir Palamides, Sir Palamides becomes not a really simplistic, you know, sort of moral exemplar or something like that. He never becomes a buffoon. Um, and I find my liking of him and my uh, uh, admiration for him and my pity for him, my compassion for him, uh, is only stirred up more and more as I watch him fail and flounder in this section. And I'm very, very interested in the way that Tolkien depicts that. This is why Sir Palamides, for me, is the hero. Like, I would want to do the story of Sir Palamides. Um, and this is the section where, to me, that really comes alive more than, more than anywhere else. Um, so let's get straight to it and see how far we can get. Okay, so we had uh, we had ended just when we were learning about the murder of Sir Lamorak. So I wanted to. This is our final uh, sort of uh, our, the the fullest information we get. It's Palamides who tells the story. He's he's uh, heard the news and is passing it along to Sir Tristram and Sir Gareth and Sir Dinadin. He wis said Sir Palamides. So wold I that as Tristram, remember, has just said that he, he wishes more than anything, more than all the gold between here and Rome, that he could have been there, right, with Sir Lamorak when he was attacked by Sir Gawain and his brothers. So wold I, and yet had I never the gree at no justice, no other tournament, and that noble knicked Sir Lamorak had be there. But other on horseback, other Ellis on foot, he put me ever to the wars. And that die that Sir Lamorak was slain, he did the most deeds of arms that ever I saw Kneek do in my life. And one he was given the gree by my lord King Arthur, Sir Gawain, and his three brethren, Sir Agravine, Sir Gaheris, and Sir Mordred, set upon Sir Lamorak in a privy place, and there they slew his horse. And so they fought with him on foot more than three hours, both before him and behind him, and so Sir Mordred gaff him his death's wound behind him at his back, and all to hew him, for one of his squires told me that saw it. Now fie upon treason, said Sir Tristram, for it slayeth mine heart to hear this tale. And so it doth mine, said Sir Gareth, brethren as they be of as they be mine. Uh, Gareth's condemnation, of course, there is particularly poignant. We saw this emphasized at the end of the book of Sir Gareth, how he distanced himself 
uh, from Gawain. We had that very clearly. Of course, Sir Gareth has finally reemerged in the narrative. Presumably, he has been living in that state of semi-retirement, which befits a good husband, as Lancelot suggested when he was explaining why he was never going to get married. Um, but uh, he's he's uh, he's back out on the circuit now, at least for a little while. Um, so, yeah, and Jennifer, there's a there's there is a good deal of foreshadowing about several things here, right? It's not exactly direct foreshadowing in a sense. It is in that it's Sir Mordred who strikes the death wound, but it's not a very direct foreshadowing in in in, in a sense of Arthur's death, as Mordred isn't going to kill him from behind, uh, uh, shamefully and treacherously. Um, not personally, anyway. It's not how the death blow of King Arthur is going to be struck. Um, Though you could say, politically speaking, it's exactly what's going to happen, right? Um, the bigger sort of implication, I think, here is that we can see we can see what Gawain has escalated to, right? And we talked about this a little bit before. We remember the exchange between Gawain and Gaharis when they were expressing their envy and animosity towards King Pellinor when they believed that he had killed their father, which he didn't. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, and they were talking about, you know, uh, 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 assailing him and killing him, which they did, um, but not like this. This is completely shameful, right? Look at the number of, you know, nightly codes they're breaking here, right? First of all, they're striking back at him at the end of a tournament in which he won the Gris, right? He was awarded the prize by King Arthur, and they should be honoring him and respecting him. They should be worshiping him, right? Uh, giving him worship, and instead, uh, they are through their own envy, their own animosity towards him. And it's more than just envy at his accomplishments, of course. There's that whole business about his father and, and their mother, which whom Gaharis killed. Um, but anyway, in addition, uh, it's not just that he won and that they should respect that and respect Arthur's gift there, but they're taking advantage of the fact that he's exhausted, right? Remember, this was foreshadowed earlier on with Lamorak himself. Remember when we first saw Sir Lamorak was when he was doing really, really well in a tournament and Lancelot did not want to fight against him. Arthur's like, Hey, who's that guy? You know, take him down Lancelot. And Lancelot's like, heck no. Right. You know, he's been, uh, uh, you know, he's been exerting himself all day long. It would, it would, it would, it would bring me shame, um, to, uh, uh, to 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 you know take him down now when I'm fresh and he's exhausted, and that's exactly what you know. So not only do they attack him when he's exhausted at the end of the day when he has been exerting himself all day long, not only do they attack him four on one, right? But they kill his horse on purpose so that they can fight him four on one on foot, right? Which is harder to defend. That is. Um, if you are on horseback, right, and you're being attacked four to one, you can still kind of maneuver. They can't necessarily close in, in you know, and encircle you in the same way, right? Because it's easier for you to kind of break your way out with your horse through their horses, um, uh, you know, and everyone's still kind of moving around on foot, right? They can really trap him and corner him, which they do. And of course, in the end, Mordred stabs him in the back. And then even the final hewing of his body, right, as he's lying, that is just shameful, a shameful, shameful way to treat people. I mean, we see the complete, um, this is, this is beyond unknightly, right? This is beyond, uh, uh, you know, just like having a tendency to be vengeful, right? This is, uh, um, this is, this is pure wickedness. This is, this is Bruce sans pitié uh, uh, level stuff, right? Um, we're, we're, Gawain and his brothers have descended beyond the level even of like Sir, well, at least down to the level of, of, of Sir Garland and pretty much any other um, villain that we've met um, uh, in this story. And, uh, and again, we see Gareth very firmly distanced from that. Notice Sir Palamides, right? Sir Palamides is very... He's always remembering, right? He's always remembering all those times he came in second, right? Um, he says, so would I 
wish that I had been there, right? And yet had I never the gree at no justice, another tournament, and that noble knig Sir Lamarack had be there, right? You know, he has like, you know, every time I met that guy, he beat me, right? And he took away what honor I had been winning in the tournament before he started in, right? Um, so he fondly, he, 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 he thinks well of him, even though like that guy always beat me everywhere. We can see, uh, just, you know, we can see what like, that's such an open wound for Sir Palamides, right? We can see how it eats away at him constantly. The guy is always coming in second place at best, right? Depending on who's present um, at any given tournament. Um, and even here, when his whole point is to express solidarity with Lamarack and admiration of Lamarack and, and condemnation of his murderers, he still can't help himself, right? He still goes there as he introduces it. Um, yeah. Now, Nancy, I agree with you. It is very interesting that they all wish that they'd been there to fight at the time, um, but nobody's really swearing vengeance, Nancy. And in fact, we've even seen the when Tristram meets Geharis and was it, it was Geharis and Mordred, wasn't it? Um, and he he catches them like so they've just been killing folks and he comes upon them. They're like, hey, you know, he hears that there are these two knights that have just been murdering people. And so he goes and catches them. Um, and not only does he not, uh, you know, I'd like fight to the utterance against the both of them and slay them for the misdeeds, which he has like they have just been doing and don't conceal that they've been doing. Don't deny that they've been doing. He also, Nancy, throws the death of Sir Lamarack in their faces and they're not sorry. Right. And yet he doesn't say like for the sake of Sir, of Sir Lamarack, let's go. It is like they... Um, if had they been there, right, had they been there side by side, shoulder to shoulder with Sir Lamarack or back to back with Sir Lamarack, they would have fought against them and they would have fought against them to the utterance. But since they weren't there, there's nothing they could do. Right. And it's tricky because, of course, I'm not sure they're wrong. Right. If they go after them, if they hunt them down and kill them. They're just the same. Right. What we're seeing is, you know, that that remember, it was exactly that kind of vengeance. Right. You killed my father. Prepare to die is where Sir Gawain's career began. Right. Uh, so and Zach, yes, the fear of Arthur is protecting them. Tristram brings that up. He's like, you know, remember, that was this. We, we talked about this near the end of last time. That was the speech where Sir Tristram was saying, you know, it is a shame that you are that you come of such a high kindred. Right. Meaning it's too bad that you do. And also you bring shame upon the high kindred of which you come. Um, and Karita, yeah, it's really hard to avoid that. Justice should be Arthur's job, but he isn't doing it. Um, we're going to see Lancelot give a positive example. Um, if if we get there, you'll know we will have accomplished my wildest dreams tonight. Uh, it's the very last slide of my long list today. Um, uh, it's at the very, very end of the Sir Palamides uh, section. But um, we will see Lancelot stamp out, stamp on any tendencies towards this kind of, uh, 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 you know, these kinds of actions. Um, and he he keeps the peace, right? I mean, he, he enforces justice within his, uh, you know, uh, oversight, right? Arthur isn't. I mean, he's just not. And I, you can't avoid that indictment. This is Arthur's job. In as much as Gawain and, his, uh, and most of his brothers are completely running amok, um, that's on Arthur. Uh, doubly on Arthur. I mean, it would be on Arthur if anybody did this. It's doubly on Arthur because it's his own kin who are protected by their kinship uh, with him uh, who are who are doing this. Uh, <laughs> Dora Stroke, you're right. Uh, Sir Dinadin doesn't express the wish that he had been there to fight, right? Which, of course, knowing Sir Dinadin is, is hardly surprising. Um, yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Efficiency. That's our... That's our plan tonight. Um, no speak we of other deed, as said Sir Palamides, and let him be, for his life ye may not get again. That is the more pity, said Sir Dinadan, for Sir Gawain and his brethren, except you, Sir Gareth, 
hatteth all good knictes of the round table, for the most party, for well I wot, as they micht, privily they, ha they hat my lord Sir Launcelot and all his kin, and great privy despite they have at him. And certainly that is my lord Sir Launcelot well aware of, and that causeth him the more to have the good knictes of his kin about him. Notice, again, this is again, sort of an expression of where Sir Gawain is sort of devolved to at this point, right? Sir Gawain and most of the brothers, again, always Sir Gareth accepted, hate all good knights of the round table for the most part, right? Um, so what is it that fuels them? Desire for vengeance, yes, but envy, right? And remember, we saw this go back again to that conversation between Gareth and Gawain when they plotted their first murder, right? Um, which was the murder of King Pellinor, remember what set that off. It was seeing him get his seat at the right table and to be given a great seat right next to the peril to the seat to the siege perilous, right? Um, King Arthur put King Pellinor in a seat of honor at the round table, and Gawain was ticked, right? That's the murder of our father, and he's being you know, he's being preferred and we want, you know, so uh, it wasn't just the fact of King Pellinor being there. It was the fact that King Pellinor was was being preferred, right, was winning honor uh, and glory. Um, and uh, and yeah, so. Um, so. Envy. The, of course, this is going to be really important, right? Sir Palamides. Uh, and this, this, you know, brings me back. It's one of the reasons I think that the story of Sir Palamides gets as much play as it does, right? Apart from the fact that it's just a cool story. Um, Sir Palamides is a wonderful example of, he is, he is on the brink of the same moral precipice that Sir Gawain has like leapt over completely. Right. Um, Sir Palamides is a fascinating study of how does a knight go wrong? The narrative hasn't stuck with Sir Gawain. We, we got some Sir Gawain stories way back, right, in his youth. He's just been kind of coming in and out uh, really ever since the, the you know, uh, Gawain, Uwain and Marhalt section. Um, you know, he's been kind of phasing in and out of the stories at different points. Um, but we haven't really followed his career or, or you know, we, we can we can sort of plot a projection, but it's just kind of drawing lines between episodes that we learn about. Right. With Palamides, we see a lot more closely. Right. And we can see Sir Gawain serves as a kind of cautionary tale for Sir Palamides. Right. He could go that way. His envy, of course, you know, and, and you think about how for how many. This is a factor. Envy is a huge, huge factor. Um, it is one of the great prevailing sins of the Arthurian court, which, of course, makes a great deal of sense. Envy is always going to be one of the primary moral pitfalls in a society which is really focused on status, right? When everybody's always looking at the leaderboard, envy is always going to be a very present danger. Right. Kind of like academia. I always have felt that envy is the, the prevailing sin of academia. I think a lot of people don't really understand that, but they should read more medieval morality and then they would. Um, uh, but uh, anyhow, yeah, no, I, I could I could tell some illustrative stories about that, actually, but I'm not going to. Anyway, because uh, I don't want to get distracted. Um but we can see this all over the place, right? And we can so we, we can see all these different ways in which again this this seems to be something, um, definitely a, a sort of a moral quandary. It's the it's the, sort of the flip side, right, of all of this seeking for worship that people do. And it's interesting. You might think, you know, you listen to everybody talk about worship and winning worship and being concerned about the praise that they're getting in the eyes of everybody else, and you might think. Um, you know, especially if you're if you're at all interested in sort of Christian morality, you might think that pride was the big concern around here. Right? You, might, you might be looking at these people and being like, oh, man, like, you know, pride is obviously the big stumbling stone of these guys. Right. Just to be so full of themselves uh, that they, you know, are just like blind to everything else and become just absolutely, uh, absolutely at up with pride uh, as uh, uh 
uh, Mrs. Bennett might say in Pride and Prejudice. But that's not the problem, right? Pride is not their problem. Envy is their problem. Envy is the prevailing sin of the Arthurian world. We see it in Gawain. We see it uh, in King Mark, right? In King Mark, we get another, uh, you know, major exemplar of what it looks like when envy just absolutely runs amok. What is it that leads somebody to become an enemy of someone just because they're doing well, right? Just because they're a good... Why do you hate somebody because they're good, right? That wouldn't seem to make any sense, but it makes all kinds of sense. That's exactly what envy does. Um, uh, exactly what envy does. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Gerald Michael says it's like the Iliad, but with more envy. Yeah, yeah. No, you can see he's very he's very uh, uh, sensitive to this now. Uh, Stephen, envy doesn't exactly come from, well, sorry, uh, Stephen's wondering if it doesn't envy come from pride. Uh, they are related. They are related. Um, the, I have always felt that the categorizations, the categorizations of the seven deadly sins, so the seven deadly sins are divided into three categories uh, in medieval morality. And I have always felt that that categorization was very insightful. Um, I, th I, 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 I think that they're really onto something from a psychological standpoint uh, when they break things down this way. Um, and I think I've talked about this before, but I can never remember where, I, where I've talked about it before. So in case it wasn't here, I'll talk about it again. Um, you know, the seven deadly sins, of course, are the, the, I'll, I'll do them in their sets, right? There's the, the sin of greed, right, or avarice, which is by itself. That is the sin of the world. Then there's the three sins of the flesh, which are lust, sloth, and gluttony, and those three are all connected and all kind of lead to each other. It's sloth, actually, that's sort of the gateway sin, uh, and gluttony, uh, and uh, and then lust is kind of the culminating one uh, of those three. Um, but they're all sins of the flesh. Those are all they. Those are all they're cousins to each other, right? And do sort of lead to one another. And similarly, pride, envy, and wrath are the sins of the devil. Those are all. Um, also interconnected and similar to those are first cousins to each other. Um, so they are like one another, Stephen, but it's, and, and they can sort of lead to one another, but they're, uh, the, the, the medieval moralists insisted that they were two separate things. Uh, but again, they're clearly, they're clearly connected. Right. Um, so I, I think that that's, um, yeah, Karita says, I remember the day I learned the difference between envy and jealousy and how the world made so much more sense. Absolutely. Yeah, that to me was uh, a really huge thing in my life, too, I think. Uh, it really does help to make much more sense of the world when you understand the difference between jealousy and envy. Um, and again, sir, uh, I, all of these guys are, you know, again, envy is the prevailing sin of the Arthurian court. Um, and Sir Palamides is the most subtle and nuanced illustration of this, right? The one guy who is both very susceptible to envy, right? And also fighting it, right? And occasionally winning his fight, but not always, right? You've got people like Lancelot who seem more or less immune to it, right? It's easy not to be envious when you're the best, right? Um, uh, I guess he has a certain advantage uh, when it comes to that. Um, but, um, anyway, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's funny, Zach, I see you, uh, mention the New York Yankees. I have to admit, uh, I had some moments of deep discomfort the first time I ever read the description, the medieval descriptions of envy. And realized that it like exactly described the sentiment of like every sports fan <laughs> that exists. Like, you know, when you because of the classic definition of envy is, uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you are you are uh, ex suffering from envy. Right. You, you know, are you, you know, you are committing the sin of envy if you are rejoicing when something bad happens to someone and celebrating. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Rejoicing when something bad happens to them and mourning when something good happens to them, right? If you catch yourself doing that, 
you are you are guilty of the sin of envy. Like that's like you know classic. And so Zach, yeah, I'm sitting there. I'm like, yeah, and reflecting on my own relationship with the New York Yankees, right? And I'm like, uh, that's a little uncomfortable, actually. Um, but um, but anyway, yeah. So Karita, yeah, exactly. What Palomai, what makes Sir Palomide so interesting to me is that it's not, you know, King Mark is a caricature, right? And you know, he's a useful caricature, and he's kind of a fun caricature sometimes, but he's not like a person, right? You know, you, it's you. In King Mark is not being dramatized like the struggles of a real human soul, right? He is. A f- like a framework, right? He is uh, a kind of a negative exemplar, right? And Sir Gawain is kind of going down that road too. To some extent, we can see Sir Gawain is still, he's still kind of human enough to be a kind of cautionary tale, perhaps. Um, but in um, in Sir Palamides, we get somebody who very much has a problem, right? He's got a problem, Um but he, we see him trying to manage his problem, right? Trying to overcome his problem. Sometimes he seems almost to do it. Sometimes he falls backwards. Uh, and it is that drama, that spiritual and psychological drama of uh, Sir Palamides that in my uh, book makes him so interesting. And I know, and I've talked about this before, um, that I know that there are some people who have little tolerance for Sir Lancelot because he's like Mr. Perfect, who doesn't seem to struggle with most of these things. Um, give him time. He will. Right. We'll see that. And that's when uh, really sort of when the, when the story gets really, really good is when that the kind of psychological drama that we see in Sir Palamides kind of expands and uh, and we see it happening in other characters and all over the place both in small and in big uh, example you know sort of big uh, uh, big big picture so uh, anyway yeah Nancy I agree it is really great how he can never fully escape it and it's an ongoing struggle like no matter what happens Sir Palamides like it's gonna be an issue right the dude is always gonna come in second and he knows it right? So like, and he, he's never going to be just okay with that. Like, it's never going to be easy for Sir Palamides, right? How is he going to make peace with it? And then, of course, you have on top of that, on top of the fact that he's always going to come in second at best uh, in tournaments and, and things and in public reputation, there's also the fact that he's in love with La Belle Zone, right? So uh, his love is never going to love him back because she loves the guy he always comes in second to. Right. And so the way we see again in Sir Palamides, not only this tendency towards envy, not only this understandable tendency towards envy, but we see this um, extreme, like his temptations to envy are very understandable and at times extreme. Right. Um, this is a guy who is in, uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, the guys who the guy who always comes in second is in a, is in a is in greater danger. Right when it comes to his own temptations to envy, then the guy who always comes in fifteenth, right? Um, both might fall to envy, but the temptations that will beset the guy who always comes in second are going to be even keener, right? So uh, I, I, again, I think in Sir Palamides we not only see this most human, most interesting, most uh, nuanced, and most dynamic of sort of wrestlings with this issue, which is such a broad issue for the entire Arthurian court. But we also see it done in a real, I mean, it's a real pressure cooker for poor Palamides, right? This guy has to, the tests that he has to pass are very difficult and really, uh, and really painful. Um, yeah, Karita says he, he he makes me wish I could be the good fairy in the story who sets him up with a nice girl who loves him back. It would be nice to be able to give Sir Palamides a nice King Peleus ending. Remember King Peleus, right, who loved that really horrible uh, woman who was always humiliating him, right? And then the Lady of the Lake comes along and turns everything on its head and he went, goes off with the Lady of the Lake and lives happily ever after. Um, yeah, it would be kind of fun to give Sir Palamides an ending like that. Um but anyway, the other thing I wanted to before we before we move on, and I, I'm glad to have these sort of larger uh, framework conversations because they will set up uh, they will increase our efficiency later on. Um, 
But before we move on from this slide, of course, I want to I want to point out the sort of the obvious but really important fact. I've been talking about the strain in the Arthurian court and the way in which we can already see, see things things are crumbling, right? Cracks are opening uh, in the system in the court itself, right? Um, you know, the the there are ways in which the story, right? The, the, the Arthurian, the trend of the Arthurian world is still on the up swing, right? We've not, it's not really hit its apex theoretically yet, but I, I believe that's really a very theoretical apex. Um, uh, and I'm not sure it hasn't been in decline already still for some time. And here's one of the things we see, right? One of the evidences of that, look at the factions, that are opening up here. Armed factions. Um, we have Sir Gawain's faction who hate Sir Lancelot and they have it out for, they've killed Sir Lamorak. They're thinking about Sir Lancelot next just because he's the best, right? Uh, and they don't like that, right? Because of uh, their <laughs> apparently the, the envy issues that they're not struggling with enough, right? Um, and Lancelot, but Lancelot has a faction, right? Because he has a bunch of kindred. Uh, he's got his brothers and cousins and second cousins, all of them. Uh, and we've met many, many of them, right? You know, Ector and Bors and uh, I don't know if we've encountered Lionel too much. I think once or twice. I think we met Sir Lionel in um, back in the Roman campaign. Uh, but we haven't encountered him too much since then. But of course, we've encountered Sir Bleoberus and Sir Blamor and, uh, and all of those people. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, oh yeah, Morgan, you're absolutely right. Gawain doesn't come off well in the Sir Pelleas story either. You're absolutely correct about that. Um, anyway, so we have all those French knights, right? The 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 descendants of King Ban and King Bors. Um, so Lancelot is not going to turn out like Lamorak because he's got his posse with him. Um, so it's true, you know, uh, uh, Nancy, I think it was you who was uh, sort of marveling before that, uh, yeah, uh, that Lancelot goes around with bodyguards, right? Which seems a little bit strange that, you know, the strongest knight in the world would need bodyguards, but he knows, like, even the strongest knight in the world. Lamorak could have, as Tristram points out very clearly, uh, uh, to it was Agravain and Mordred, Agravain and Geharis, I can't remember which two it was. Anyway, to the two Orkney boys that he ran into, um, Lamorak could have taken either one of you, right? And it was a good thing that the four of you all teamed up on him at once, because there is no way uh, that uh, any of you could have taken him. Um, so yeah, the fact that Lancelot is stronger than all of them won't matter if they kill him in his sleep, right? If they catch him sleeping alone by a well and stab him, which they would, right? Um, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna matter. So the Lancelot's kin holds about him. So we have this, you know, it's like, you know, the Arthurian court is beginning to look more and more like West Side Story, right? With the gangs of people going around, uh, you know, never wanting to be caught alone lest they be captured by the other gang. You know, this is, this is, uh, this is where the world has already, you know, the direction this world has already been moving. Um, okay. And again, that's something might be important later. Now, uh, a brief look at the story of the Red City. So, Sir Tristram, Sir Gareth, Sir Dinadin, and Sir, uh, oh, what's his name? Palamides. Yeah, you know the one I'm, I'm always talking about. Um, have this encounter, right? They see this boat uh, with mariners on it, you know, because it's a boat. Uh, and uh, there's a dead guy who has a letter in his hand, right? A dead knight with a letter in his hand. Uh, now, Ma Meister Mariner, sighed Sir Tristram. What meaneth this letter? Sir, sighed they. In that letter shall ye hear and canoe how he was slain, and for what cows, and what was his nam. But, sir, sighed the mariners. Wit you well that no man shall talk that letter and read it, but if he be a good knight, and that he will faithfully promise to revenge his death, and Ellis there shall no knight see that letter open. And wit you well, said Sir Tristram, that some of us may revenge his death as well as another, and if it be if it so be as ye mariners sigh, his death shall be revenged. And therewithal Sir Tristram took the letter out of the knight's hand, and then he opened it, and thus hit specify it. Harmounts, king and lord of the Red City, I send to all Knictis Arrant, 
recommending unto you, noble Knechtes of Arthur's court, that I beseech them, that I beseech them all among them, to find on Knecht that will fight for my sack, with twelve brethren that I brocked up of Noct, and felonsly and traitorly they slew me. Wherefore I beseech on good Knecht to revenge my death, and he that revengeth my death, I wall that he have my red city and all my castles. Okay, now, this is... Um, oh, Stephen is asking, would the Mariners usually be literate? Um, uh, I don't know that they are. Uh, they're not uh, reading the letter. They're just making sure nobody takes the letter unless they agree they're going to fulfill the quest after they do, right? The interesting thing is, uh, well, of course, Tristram is literate, right? Because uh, he's Sir Tristram. And he's like all oh, Mr. Book learning. He, he, remember, he's the guy who wrote the book on hunting. Uh, so Sir Tristram is literate because he's all got all that fancy learning that Sir Trist, that you know makes Sir Tristram Sir Tristram and makes all gentlemen uh, you know always grateful to him because he invented hunting, right, and all the terms thereof. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, so so Carita, the specifics of who can read it, it's a commitment, right? This is not for the idly curious. Um, if you read this letter, you are making the commitment that you are going to, to do, uh, to do what it says, right? That you're, that you're, you know, so you are taking this quest upon you. Um, so, uh, you know, make sure you're, you're ready to commit before you read the letter, um, is what the, the message is there. Now, Ben, he wrote this letter after he was felonsly slain uh, because he wasn't quite, he was, he was dictating, right? Uh, he, was, he was mortally wounded, as we will learn later, and yet he was able to dictate this letter before he died. So that's why he speaks of his own death uh, in the past tense because, you know, he was, he was, he was bleeding out, but, uh, you know, he still had enough time to, uh, to dictate. Um, Gerald asks if taking a, bi a blind commitment is wise. Well, you know, <laughs> there's a certain degree of risk involved there, of course. Uh, the thing is, is that like to to undertake a quest like this, you know, to 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 agree in advance to this before you read the letter. It's not like a rash vow, right? If you make a rash vow, then it's dishonorable to f to not follow through even if you don't remember when you know la belle Isode made a rash vow to go off with sir palamides right and he held her to it largely because it seems he wanted to goad sir tristram into fighting him um but um anyway so he uh when you make a rash vow you have given your word and you've put yourself into a different place when you just say i'm going to take the adventure that comes right um, like if a damsel comes up to you and says, Hey, you know, could you help me? And you're like, yeah, sure. And you go off with her. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're morally obligated to do like horrible things. Right. So if they read the letter and it said, you know, go like kill the first four women that you meet or something horrible. Right. You wouldn't like be then obligated to do that or you're dishonored. Right. So there's a risk. It's not that risky. I don't think that you're, you're not bound to that, but, um, you know, if the, uh, uh, but basically now somebody needs to go on this quest because it's, it's clearly an honorable quest. It's nothing, uh, nothing horrible that's being, um, uh, that's being requested here. But, um, um, yeah, it's, um, but somebody's got to do this, right? And it, remember, it's Sir Tristram who's reading this. I call this a cautionary quest, though, because this seems, really interesting to me coming as it does so soon after we learn about the murder of Sir Lamorak. So I've got Sir Gawain and the Orkney boys on my mind, right? Um, and then I read about poor King Harmons, who's a great guy, apparently he was a great guy. He's dead now, but uh, he was a great guy and kind and generous, right? Um, but what happened due to, you know, his kindness and generosity, he brought up these bad eggs, right, through his kindness and generosity in his court. And then they destroy his court and then kill him, right, in order to seize power for themselves. 
I'm not saying that it's an exact parallel, of course, to King Arthur's situation, but King Harmans clearly also did not maintain justice and order in his court, right? Um, that the two brethren that he brought up of Nacht, they got out of control and he did not control them. And in the end, it led to his own destruction. So it seems at least relevant, right? Um, let's get a little bit more detail here. So this is uh, Sir Abel, who is uh, one of the knights, uh, one of the good guys, uh, 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 kinsman of King Harmonts, um, whom uh, Sir Palamides... So remember, Sir, pa Sir Palamides... Sir Tristram is inclined to do the quest himself, and Sir Palamides begs to be let... to be allowed to do it, right? Uh, and Sir Tristram, to his credit, allows Sir Palamides to take this quest unto himself, Right, so here is Sir Palamides trying to accomplish this great deed, uh, and you know what? This is something that he like. If he does this, he won't come in second. Right, he will have achieved a thing. Right, and that's really cool. Anyway, so he meets Sir Abel. Sir, said Sir Abel, our king brought up of childer, twa men that now are perilous knictes, and these twa knictes, our king had them so in favour that he loved no man, nor trusted no man of his own blood, nor none other that was about him. And by these two knictes our king was governed, and so they ruled him peaceably, and his londes, and never would they suffer none of his blood to have no rule with our king." And also he was so free and so gentle, and they so false and so deceivable, that they ruled him peaceably. And that aspired the lords of our king his blood, and departed from him unto their own leaf lord. And when those traitors understood that they had driven all lords of his blood from him, than were they not pleased with such rule, but ever thought to have more. And as ever hit is an old sow, Give a choral rule, and thereby he will not be sufficed. For whatsoever he be that is ruled by a villain born, and the lord of that soil be a gentleman born, that same villain shall destroy all the gentlemen about him. Therefore, all the statis and lordes of what a stat ye be, look ye be war, whom ye talk about you. And I think we can all profit from that moral lesson. Um, so, uh... Yeah, Nancy says she's getting uh, um, <laughs> worm tongue vibes here. She also points out uh, that this is really long for an old saw. <laughs> right? Old saws are not normally so long. It's true. It's not very catchy, is it? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, the moral that Sir Abel comes back to is ultimately one about estates, right? Um they were churls, these two guys. They're they're of the they're of the the third estate, right? They're peasants, um, and they are elevated above their station. They are brought in. They're made knights, and they're allowed to you know essentially rule, um, not officially rule. Like they're not given lordship over all of the lands, right? Um, and yet we see their greed and their ambition and their desire for more and more, which is in a way actually almost a little ref refreshing, right? Somebody who's not motivated by envy. Um, but um, anyway, the, 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 the moral lesson that Sir Abel takes from this, you know, his old saw here, you know, look what happens when you put churls in charge, right? If you let a churl rule. Now, I would say his, his um, the moral of his story here in large part is like, it's about, it's against... Uh, it's against mobility, you know. I'm tempted to use the modern phrase upward mobility, um, but it's not just about upward. It's about shifting from one estate to another estate. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody will thrive best in the place where they belong to be. We learned that lesson back from Sir Tor, right, uh, who was so unhappy living with his... Uh, uh, non-father, right? His stepfather, um, Ares the cowherd. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> Karina says trolls in charge sounds like a sitcom yeah that would be it's like the medieval version right um yeah druid's fire was thinking the same thing yeah exactly um yeah so uh here we can see the the same thing remember what uh the the same business we got not only back with sir tor but also at the beginning of the book of sir gareth with with sir Kay, right who was convinced that um, Beaumains was a must be a peasant, right? And not, in fact, of the second estate. And so, you know, that's why he put him to work in the kitchens and, uh, and, and teased him and why he challenged him as soon as he put on his armor again because he thought he was faking. You'll remember the whole ladle washer thing. That's what Lynette kept um, upbraiding with, uh, uh, Gareth with, you know, accusing him of being a, a, a jumped up peasant who was faking it and wearing armor. Here we can see it actually happening, you know, with a negative outcome, right? These two guys are, in fact, bad eggs. Um, and, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this is their story. But again, notice how they. The other thing that I I would suggest is interestingly relevant for the larger story in which this little story about the Red City is embedded uh, is the way in which these two brothers who are shown kindness and great indulgence by the king alienate everybody else, right? Um, and drive away all of those who should be helping and supporting Harmons. And once Harmons is exposed, right, without any of his other kin, without any of his lords uh, and other vassals by him, that's when they strike and kill him and just take over his lands and uh, make themselves the lords of all of his property, right? Um, and again, I, I think there are some lessons there, perhaps, uh, that some could learn, especially as I think about uh, Sir Gawain and the Orkney boys. So Sir Palamides accepts the battle. Right. And he fights them in one of them. He kills right away. Right. He, he impales one of them uh, on the first jousts and then he ends up fighting uh, with the second one. But the second one, uh, uh, Sir Helius, is very, very strong uh, and almost wins. Right. So here we have uh, Sir Palamides getting beaten up and down the field by uh, by Sir Helius. Thon one lay of the city saw Sir Palamides in this cast. They wept and cried and mad great dole, and the other party mad as great joy. So there are there are supporters, of course, of these of these two guys. So we have the two different uh, cheering sections. Alas, said the men of the city, that this noble knight should thus be slain for our king's sack. And as they were thus weeping and crying, Sir Palamides, which had suffered an hundred strokes, and wonder it was that he stood on his feet, so at the last Sir Palamides looked about as he meeked weakly unto the common people, how they wept for him. And then he said to himself, Ah, fie for sham, Sir Palamides, why hang ye your head so low? And therewith he bar up his shield, and looked Sir Helius in the visor, and smote him a great stroke upon the helm, and after that another, and another. And then he smote Sir Helius with such a meek that he felled him to the earth groveling. And then he rasped off his helm from his head, and so smote off his head from the body. And then were the people of the city the merriest people that meeked be. So they brought him to his lodging with great solemnity, and there all the people become his men, and Than Sir Palamides prayed them all to take keep unto the lordship of King Harmounts. For, Fire Cyrus, wit you well, I may not at this time abide with you, for I must in all hast be with my lord King Arthur at the castle of Lonezep. Remember, he promised Sir Tristram before he departed on this quest, that he would certainly be there. Sir Tristram kind of challenged him, right? Like, you're not going to take this as an excuse not to be there. You're totally coming to the tournament at Lonazep, right? And Sir Palamides swore great oaths that he would be there, right? So he can't stay. Um, but here, Palamides um, is... Uh, <laughs> David Erbach says, I pictured this in slow motion. I know it's, it's, it's a really great description, isn't it? And by the way, I always love it when Sir Palamides talks to himself, right? Uh, I, I get, we get more of the kind of interiority of Sir Palamides 
um, than we do of, 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 of most of the other knights in this book, actually. Um, but anyhow, Sir Pal this is one of Sir Palamides' best days, right? Sir Palamides just accomplished a great quest and won this whole city. All of these people, you know, uh, become his men, right? They swear fealty to Sir Palamides. He is now the lord of the Red City uh, and the lord of all of the lands of King Harmance in his own right. He leaves Sir Ebo, I think, doesn't he? Uh, leaves Sir Ebo as his steward in charge, right? And he says he's got to go. He's got to go to Lana Zepp. Um, but, hey, it's a day in which Sir Palamides doesn't come in second. And we see how important it is to him to keep his promise to go to the castle of Lana Zepp. On the one hand, you would think this would be like this. This this could be Sir Palamides graduation party. Right. We could we could, uh, it would be easy to be like, and then Sir Palamides lived happily ever after, right? In the city where everyone loved him uh, as their deliverer, uh, you know, from uh, these two treacherous guys and like, you know, and everybody loved him and, and supported him and appreciated everything that he did. And he lived happily ever after and was never envious again, the end, right? But he has to go back. He swore that he would go back. And what's more, he swore to Sir Tristram that he would go back. And if he doesn't go back, then Sir Tristram may think, understandably, that he um, was chickening out, right, in not coming through. So if there's anybody that he's going to fulfill that kind of a promise to, it's not really King Arthur that he's going to be with, right? It's Sir Tristram. Um, but okay, let's head to Lana Zepp here. Oh, wait, but just before we get there, we get this one interesting reminder when he catches up with Sir Tristram. Uh, and Sir Tristram has, is this is at b back at Joyous Guard, right? They've gotten back to Joyous Guard. Um, he gets back and he tells him, oh, yeah, you know, beat those guys, uh, uh, won the, city, the Red City. Truly, said Sir Tristram, I am glad ye have well sped, for ye have done worshipfully. Well, said Sir Tristram, we must forward as to morn. And Thon he devised how it should be. And there Sir Tristram devised to send his twa pavilions to set him fast by the well of Lona Zepp, and therein shall be the Queen La Belle Isode. Ye say well, said Sir Dinadan. But Juan Sir Palamides heard of that, his heart was ravished out of measure. Notwithstanding, he said but little. So when they come to joyous guard, Sir Palamides would not have gone into the castle, but as Sir Tristram lad him by the hond into joyous guard. And when Sir Palamides saw La Belle Isode, he was so ravished that he meeked uneth speak. And so they went on to meet, but Sir Palamides meeked not eat, and there was all the cheer that meeked be had. And so on the morn they were apparelled, they, they were apparelled, for to ride toward Lana Zepp. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Karita says heartbreak emoji. Um, yeah. Nancy, don't you see it? Yes, absolutely. He's doing his best, right? He knows this is a bad situation, right? Um, you can see the division in his own heart, right? This is his lady, right? He loves La Belle Isode. Does he want to see her again? Yes, he wants to see her again. Does he want to spend time with her and Sir Tristram? No. Remember, Sir Tristram doesn't know that he loves La Belle Isode. Now, I don't know why he doesn't know that, as he, uh, Palamides and Tristram fought and met and fought for the very first time way back in Ireland when they were both competing for the love of La Belle Isode, so I kind of thought that Tristram knew about it from then, but maybe Tristram is not exactly forgotten, but he doesn't realize that Sir Palamides has been a faithful, devoted lover of La Belle Isode ever since then, right? Um, that uh, seems to be... <laughs> Karina says Tristram is so dumb. Well, you know, okay, you know, he's uh, perhaps... Perhaps not the greatest spear on the rack. I will give you that. But, uh, but anyway, um, uh, <laughs> Nancy, that is the best observation about Sir Tristram I've heard in a long time. Nancy says that Sir Tristram lacks emotional object permanence. Uh, that's, 
That's perfectly fair. Perfectly fair, I think. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, this image of Sir Palamides here, right? Sir Palamides in Joyous Guard, where there was all of the cheer that meek be had, right? Everybody is having a great time. Tristram is there. Uh, Isode is there. Dinadin is there, the life of the party, right? Sir Gareth is there. And Palamides is there and he can't eat, right? But he's trying to not, you know, look like a, a, a you know, he's try, try not to be a buzzkill at the party either, right? And nobody seems to notice, right, what he's suffering here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and he, so you can already see, Sir Palamides in this scene um, reminds me of a recovering alcoholic who is being dragged into a bar. <laughs> Basically is what, is what Palamides is reminding me of uh, in this scene. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Meryl, uh, Marilyn, I am not sure, um, I don't remember exactly the passage you're thinking of. Marilyn is wondering if, uh, didn't Palamides once say something about how a lady wasn't worth enmity between two true knights? That seems likely, yes. I can't remember it offhand well enough to place it. But it does seem that way. And, Marilyn, in that spirit, I would also say we have to remember, and I think this is so important throughout this whole this whole thing, and it's one of the things that makes Sir Palamides' story. So if this were just a Hollywood love triangle, right, it wouldn't be that interesting of a story. As, in fact, most Hollywood love triangles are not very interesting stories. Um, but it's much more than that, right? Um, this is a love triangle, but this is a really fascinating love triangle because Palamides, uh, Sir Tristram, means a lot to Sir Palamides. Um, not just because he is the object of his envy, but it's that situation when you are constantly being thrown in with this guy who is your greatest rival and you can't help liking him and really wanting him to like you, right? So... But yet, nevertheless, still feeling uh, all of those um, very, very strong stirrings to envy, right? Uh, and rivalry with him. You still want to knock him off that high perch that he is sitting on, right? And yet, you want him to respect you. Uh, you know, his devotion to Tristram, he doesn't want Tristram to find out that he loves Isolde because it would ruin his relationship with Tristram. I mean, yeah. Very tricky. Okay. Now, Lana Zepp. The first day of Lana Zepp. The four guys together, right? And these are this is a great team. Palamides, Tristram, Dinadin, and Sir Gareth. I mean, I'll take those four against almost anybody. And uh, certainly one of the most fun groups to be with, I think. Um, I would totally share a, uh, share a pavilion with these guys. Um, but anyway, so, so those four, and they're all dressing in green, right? They're doing the whole team spirit thing. So they come to the tournament dressed in green, and now on the first day, before the first day, they're deciding. Now, seers, upon what party is it best, sighed Sir Tristram, to be withal to mourn? Do we fight on King Arthur's side or not? Sir, said Sir Palamides, ye shall have mine advice to be against King Arthur as to mourn, for on his part thee will be Sir Launcelot, and many and many good knictes of his blood with him. And the more men of worship that they be, the more worship shall we win. That is full knickly spoken, said Sir Tristram, and so shall it be, right as ye counsel me. In the name of God, sighed they all. Now, Sir Palamides, this is indeed full knickly spoken. This is how a good knight should think. It's not about political loyalties, right? They should be against King Arthur because they should always be for the underdogs, right? If they join the winning side, if they fight along with Lancelot because that looks like the side that's going to be systematically pulverizing the opponents, well, that's not knightly, right? Um, so this is 
a great choice that Sir Palamides starts with, and everybody totally agrees uh, Sir Palamides is just exactly in the right. His, his thinking is top-notch here at the beginning. This will be important later. And that first day, he follows it up with the performance of his lifetime, right? And look how it comes, ac- comes about. So Juan La Bellizode, a spy in Sir Tristram, a guy in upon his horse. So uh, he was unhorsed, uh, Lancelot unhorsed him, right? Uh, and then, and it was it was unsure, like, is he going to be taken prisoner? What's going to happen, right? And she, uh, La Bellizode, from where she's looking at her bay window, lost sight of him for a while, and she was worried. But, but then she sees him again. So Juan La Bellizode espied Sir Tristram, a guy in upon his horseback. She was passing glad, and then she lauchen mad could cheer. And as it happened, Sir Palamides looked up toward her. She was in the window, and Sir Palamides espied how she lauchfed. And therewith he took such a rejoicing that he smote down, what with his spear and with his sword, all that ever he met. For through the seat of her, he was so enamoured in her love that he seemed at that time that bo- that and both Sir Tristram and Sir Lancelot had been both against him, they should have won no worship of him. And in his heart, as the book saith, Sir Palamides wished that with his worship he meeked have ado with Sir Tristram before all men because of La Belle Isoude. Than Sir Palamides began to double his strength, and he did so marvellously, all men had wonder, and ever he cast up his eye upon La Belle Isoude. And when he saw her, mock such cheer he farred like a lion, and there he there meek no man withstand him. And Than Sir Tristram beheld him, how he stirred a boot, and said unto Sir Dinadan, So God help me, Sir Palamides is a passing good knight and well enduring, but such deed as saw I him never do, nother, nother never erst heard I tell that ever he did so much in undie. Sir, it is his die, said Sir Dinadan, and he won't say no more unto Sir Tristram, but to himself he sighed thus, and Sir Tristram knew for whose love he doth all this deeds of armies, soon he would abat his courage. Alas, said Sir Tristram, that Sir Palamides were not christened. So said King Arthur, and so said all that beheld them. Than all people gaff him the prize, as the best knicked that die, and he passed Sir Lancelot, other Ellis, Sir Tristram. Oh, wait, for Sir Palamides' sake, let's read that last sentence again. And he passed Sir Launcelot, other Ellis, Sir Tristram. Hooray, it's never been true before, right? He's said again and again, I never have the prize wherever Sir Tristram or Sir Lancelot is. I always do pretty well, right? But if Sir Lancelot or Sir Tristram or Sir Lamorak, uh, uh, you know, the much lamented, um, show up, then I never win the prize when they're there, right? I'm guaranteed to come in second. Mr. Guaranteed to come in second for the first time in his life, comes in first on a day when he is sharing the field with both Tristram and Lancelot. Um, uh, and, Carita, I agree. It's his day is a very tactful and, ca- and careful answer by Sir Dinadan. There's also, of course, truth in this, right? You know, people recognize this. This is, this is Sir Palamides' day. Right. He is surpassing himself today. This is he has never performed like he is having a career day today. Right. Um, uh, Absolutely. Now. David, I wonder. So David is saying, I assume Palamides passionate fighting is because he thinks Isolde is now favoring him, which makes me wonder if he would have ranked higher if he had loved someone who loved him back much earlier in his career. That is a really good question, David. Um. But I wonder, does Palamides think that La Belle Isoude is happy for him? I wonder. Maybe. Maybe he is looking up at her and she's looking down in his general direction and smiling and laughing. Maybe he is convincing himself that she's smiling at him, right? Uh, And thus he doubles his strength and performs these mighty deeds. Uh, for her sake. Maybe he's fooling himself if he thinks that. 
maybe he knows he's fooling himself. Maybe he is only imagining. Maybe he knows she's smiling at Tristram. I don't think Sir Palamides has any real illusions about La Belle Isode's affections or any real aspirations of winning them to himself, right? And yet, looking up and seeing her smiling and laughing down in his general direction, right, inspires him. Um, why? Because it enables him to, like... I guess the way I've always under, I've, I've always thought of this is Sir Palamides in this moment, I think knowingly, willfully, kind of entering this little fantasy world, right? Um, her looking down and smiling enables him to sort of play out this pageant, to use the word that is used so many times uh, here at the Tournament of Lana Zepp, to play out this pageant of, like, his imaginary what if, right? What if? What if... She did love me. What if she were smiling at me? What would that be like? And, David, as you imply, the answer is maybe I could beat Lancelot and Tristram, right, if that were the case. Um, yeah, and James Stevens points out, it's interesting, Sir Dinadin is usually sarcastic, right, but not today. Yeah, Sir Dinadin isn't making fun of anybody here, right? Um... Yeah. Um, both Devra and Marilyn are saying that uh, they don't think so, that he just, he just, he's just, she's happy and he's inspired at seeing her happy. Um, yeah. No, I, you know, is he pretending? Maybe not. You know, maybe you're right. Um, but here's the reason I think that or that something. I don't know, something kind of like that is uh, is going on here. And we'll see this briefly in a conversation, the conversation we have with Lancelot in a little bit. Um, knights are not just privately inspired to do well. But it's not just that, like, your like love makes you better, right? Remember that whole. Um, Thing with Tristram and Dinadin, right? About who's a better knight, lovers or non-lovers, right? You know, there's this idea that, well, like, if you are a lover, if you have a lady, then you will be a better knight than, you know, a knight who does not have that inspiration, right? But um, Lancelot specifically will speak, like, it, it matters if she's there, right? Guinevere's not here at the Tournament of Lana Zeb. She's sick. Uh, that's why, so that's why Guinevere, everybody is here except Guinevere, uh, because she's sick. And Lancelot is going to say, if Guinevere had been here, if my lady were here, I'd be winning today. Right? No two ways about that. But she's not here, so it's fine. Right? Um, it's not just about the knight being privately inspired by his love. There is a, like a two-way thing that's going on there. Right? That seems, if in order for it to work sort of properly. And that's why it seems to me so poignant that he's looking up at her and she's looking down in his general direction and laughing and smiling, right? It is the sight of her looking down, smiling and laughing, her being, looking happily down on the field where he is. Um, again, is he, is he really fooling himself? No, I don't think he's really fooling himself. Um, but again, for the first time in his, he's always thought of her, right? Privately. She has been his private inspiration at every other tournament he's ever been to. So what's the difference here? The difference here is that she is looking down towards him and smiling, right? He is doing this in front of her, in front of her smiling, laughing, happy face, right? And that is what inspires him. And I can't help but think that there is some element of fantasy there, right? And it makes it so... Like, He's not under an illusion. And that is to me what makes it so poignant. He knows. He knows she's not smiling at him. He knows that, right? And yet, um, the circumstance kind of allows him to have this one day when he is acting like a knight 
who is loved back by his lady, right? He's never been in that position before. Um, he's always been merely the forlorn lover, and now he at least is, you know, acting in the place of or in the role of a knight whose lady is looking down with admiration upon him and smiling upon him, right? Even though he knows it's not really like that, right? Um, yes, James, I absolutely agree. And I think that's a very good point. Um, it might, one might say, I, I, could, I, could, I could imagine somebody trying to make the argument that the, the, the final sentence of that first paragraph, right? And in his heart, as the book scythe, Sir Palamides wished that with his worship he meeked have ado with Sir Tristram before all men because of La Belle Isode. That might seem like a, a sour note in this scene. Right, that in the midst of his greatest glory that he is ever going to achieve, Sir Palamides is still nursing this envy of Sir Tristram. But James, I agree with you. Um, I, 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 it's not treasonous here. He just wants to imagine besting him in front of his ode and winning worship from her. Right, he once and for all. Like this is the moment where, and and in front with her looking down and smiling. He his fondest dream, his greatest ambition in the world is to prove himself a better knight than Sir Tristram in front of La Belle Isode, right? That's that's it, right? Um, but note if he could do it uh, with his worship, right? If only the circumstances somehow could be such that Tristram and I could fairly test ourselves against each other and I won with his old watching, that would be, that would be the greatest, right? Um, and I think that there is an element of fantasy there, right? I get, of wish, of wishing there, of what he, this sort of dream scenario that he has in his mind, right? Um, yeah, Nancy says, so his two wins here, the quest and the tournament, uh, are both him acting in Tristram's stead in one way or another, even if imaginarily, and that is, yes, kind of sad. Uh, it's another kind of of coming in second, right? Um, there is some, even his greatest moment of triumph, there is something of illusion and fantasy about it, right? I, I, I don't say delusion. Again, I don't go so far. I don't think he's fooling himself. Um, but there is something of the indulgence of fantasy, I think. Even in that sentence, I think we can see it. Um, then the crisis. Well, the first crisis. We're coming to the end of Palamides' day, right? And he has... And what happens? Here comes Lancelot right towards him. And Palamides, he's exhausted, right? He knows the tank's almost empty, right? And it's his day, and here comes Sir Lancelot, and, and this is it. This is like it's going to happen again. I'm going to be this close to coming in first and then Sir Lancelot's going to come and he's going to knock me off my horse and they're going to give the prize to Sir Lancelot. Right? He can see it. This, the, this scenario, it's right there. And he, it's easy for him to picture because it's happened so many times before. Right? So what happens? Rizzo, come into the field Sir Lancelot du Lac and saw and heard the great noise and the great worship that Sir Palamides had. He dressed him against Sir Palamides with a great spear and a long, and thought to have smitten him down. And when Sir Palamides saw, saw Sir Launcelot come upon him so fast, he took his horse with the spurs and ran upon him as fast with his sword. And as Sir Launcelot should have stricken him, he smote the spear on the side and smote it atu with his sword. And with his sword, sorry. And therewith Sir Palamides rushed unto Sir Launcelot, and thought to have put him to sham, and with his sword he smote off his horse's neck that Sir Launcelot rode upon, and Thon Sir Launcelot fell to the earth. Thon was the cry, high and great, how Sir Palamides the Saracen hath smitten down Sir Launcelot his horse. 
reeked so. There were many knechtes wroth with Sir Palamides because he had done that deed and held there against it and said it was unknechtly done in a tournament to kill an horse willfully, other else that it had been done in plain battle life for life. Sir Palamides screws up, right? He gives in to temptation. He panics, right? What can he do? He kills Sir Lancelot's horse. He he commits a foul, right? This is this is Sir Palamides getting a red card, right, in the tournament. Everybody calls him on this, right? That was the wrong thing to do, but why did he do it? Right? Um He did it because he knew he couldn't overcome Lancelot in bed. Not now. Not when he's as tired as he is, right? Um, even at the end of his day, it wasn't... So he panics, right? Kill his horse, uh, and then I'll be, you know, I can keep... With, you know. So he cheats, essentially, right? Um, uh, Devra asks, wasn't it unknightly of Lancelot to charge him at the end of the day? Yeah, now Lancelot had not been resting the entire... The difference there between those and the other situations like that, Lancelot's been out on the field before this t- before this point. Um, not the whole day, but he has been out on the field before, so he's not completely fresh uh, coming against somebody. But it is a little bit unfair for Lancelot to come after him here. Um, I agree. I don't think that Lancelot is completely uh, innocent here. Um yeah. Um, see, David, I'm not sure. David Arbach is suggesting that he's just kind of caught up in the heat of the struggle. And, you know, when he sees the most dangerous opponent coming upon him, he instinctively takes the most strategic action without consciously thinking that it's a wrong thing to do. I would like to think that of Sir Palamides, but I don't. I, I think he knows it. Um, notice how it's he says... Uh, um, uh, where is it? Palamides rushed unto Sir Launcelot and thought to have put him to Shama. That's the that's the smoking gun right there, right? Um, he's not just he doesn't do it unthinkingly. He does it thinkingly, um, and we can see that there. And again, everybody cries out. This is not something. I mean, it's one thing we've seen this happen before, where it happened by accident, when like the sword was deflected off of somebody's helmet and like decapitated the horse, and like you know stuff happens. Contact sport, but um, but this is this was a plan, right? And you don't if you're a good knight and you're a good tournament jouster and and fighter that you don't do that by accident. Um, yeah, and he, so he, he, this is, this is, he screwed up, right? He gave in to the temptation to try to, uh, fault, to, to, to try to defend, to, to try to stay on top, right? Um, to take desperate measures, desperate and dishonest measures in order to preserve his, uh, his day. And Lancelot is ticked. Quit thou well. Thou hast done me this die the greatest despite that ever any worshipful knick did me in tournament other injustice. And therefore, that is jousts, not justice, by the way. And therefore, I will be avenged upon thee. And therefore, attack cape to yourself. Palamides' scheme has, of course, predictably backfired. And Palamides is now facing a totally ticked off Lancelot who is going to fight him, uh, uh, foot, you know, on, on foot, sword to sword, and who is not going to take any prisoners, right? And and this is now, now Palamides having, is has brought upon himself exactly what he was hoping to avoid, which of course is what medieval moralists will tell you, you so often happens when you make the kind of choice that Palamides just made. Ah, mercy, noble Knecht, said Sir Palamides, of my deeds, and gentle Knecht, forgive me mine unknechtly deeds, for I have no power, nor meekt, to withstand you. And I have done so much this die that well I wot I did never so much, nor never shall do so much in my dies. And therefore, most noble Knecht in the world, I require thee, spare me as this die. And I promise you, I shall ever be your knecht while I live. For, and if ye put me from my worship now, ye put me from the greatest worship that ever I had or ever shall have. 
Well, sighed Sir Launcelot, I see, for to say this oath, ye have done marvellously well this day, and I understand a part for whose love ye do it, and well I wot that love is a great maestry. And if my lady were here, as she is not, with you well, Sir Palamides, ye shall not bear away the worship, but be while your love be not discovered, for an Sir Tristram may know it, ye will repent it. And sith in my quarrel is not here, ye shall have this day the worship as for me, considering the great travail and pain that ye have had this day, it were no worship for me to put you from it. And here's Sir Lancelot making a great choice and being a good guy. Um, uh, and but Endeavor, yes, this is a close call. But uh, but again, you notice there, Lancelot makes a great choice here, right? And Lancelot shows mercy very appropriately and pity for Sir Palamides. Um, that paragraph by Sir Palamides is enough to bring tears to my eyes, right? You know, I have done... I will never do this well again. Please don't. Not today. Not now. Let me have this one day. Oh, man. Um, and Lancelot adding to that, saying, I get it, man. I know what this means to you. Not just that you did so well today, but I know who you were doing it for. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, Carita, everybody knows but Tristram, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, you're kind of right. Um, yeah, and Nancy, you're right. Palamides once again really knows how to apologize, which, by the way, I think is the sign of a good person, right? Not the one who never does anything wrong. It's the one who apologizes very sincerely after they screw up again. Um, uh, yeah, and Morgan, in a sense, Palamides gets a win with an asterisk. Yes, I agree, but... I would say here, you know, again, the thing to me that is so resonant here is when he says, for and if ye put me from my worship now, ye put me from the greatest worship that ever I had or ever shall have. And had Lancelot been just a touch more stern with him or had Lancelot been a bit more prone to moralizing than he is, um, he might have said, Palamides, you did yourself from the greatest worship that you ever had when you chose to decapitate my horse, right? Um, it was Palamides and Palamides' action there, his unknightly action, that led the whole crowd to start booing him all of a sudden, right? Everybody saw that. And that's going to be the big asterisk, right? Palamides was awesome today, except that whole horse decapitation thing, which was shameful, right? So there's always going to be a but, there when people talk about Palamides great day and he knows it Palamides knows it right and Lancelot knows that he knows it right um and is willing to let it slide um and David I absolutely agree with you um there is humility in how sincerely he recognizes and regrets his unknightly action I I, I totally am with you there um even as he still longs to keep some worship uh, for the day. Yeah. Yeah. And there again, you can see the division right in him, the struggle between knowing what is right and wanting the right thing. And yet his desire for worship here, it's not but desire for worship. Isn't bad. That's clear in Mallory's morality, right? Um, that it's not bad to want worship. However, he doesn't there's a sense in which he's still trying to escape the responsibility for his action, right? The consequence of his action, the, the unknightly action he performed, someone who was a little bit morally better than Sir Palamides would not only have apologized, he would have said, I don't deserve to win the prize today because of my unknightly actions. I'm going to take the consequences of the bad choice that I made and I'm going to bow out. Right. Somebody who is even more humble than Sir Palamides might have done that. But that's not Sir Palamides. He can't let it go. Right. So we can see even in that the way that he's clinging to this, like, let me have this one win. Please let me have this one win. That's still partially his envy speaking. Right. Even though it's so moving and it's so, um, you know, again, so easy to relate to and so easy to root for. Um. 
Yeah, and Karita, I agree. Lancelot has all of the emotional and relationship savvy that Tristram lacks. You are, you are very correct about that. Um, yeah, and Stephen, I think that's also a good point. The moment Palamides r- recognizes proper knightly action is the moment that Lancelot seems to forgive him. Lancelot, I think, can see that he, he admits what he did was wrong, right? And he is, he, Lancelot, as I clearly believe, and, uh, um, as, um, as David uh, Urbach was just saying, uh, clearly believes that Palamides in, is sincere in his confession and repentance here. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, okay. Let's keep going. Day two. So he wins. Right. Palamides gets his wish and he wins the prize on the first day. The only time in his entire life he wins the prize on a day when Tristram and Lancelot are both in the field. Day two. Pre day two. Right. This is uh, pregame ceremonies here still. Tristram and Palamides and uh, Gareth and Dinadin. No, not Dinadin. This is the day when Dinadin stays in bed, I think, isn't it? Um, anyway, <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love when Tristram goes back and Dinadin is still sleeping, right? I, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Dinadin is just so awesome. Uh, but anyway, um, the conversation between Tristram and Palamides. Tristram says, How feel ye yourself? May ye do this die as ye did yesterday? Nay, said Sir Palamides. I feel myself so weary and so sore bruised of the deeds of yesterday that I may not endure as I did. That me repenteth, said Sir Tristram, for I shall lack you this day. But help yourself, said Sir Palamides, and trust not to me, for I may not do as I did. And all these words said Sir Palamides but to beguile Sir Tristram. Then said Sir Tristram unto Sir Gareth, Then must I trust upon you. Wherefore, I pray you, be not far from me to rescue me, and need be. Sir, I shall not fail you, sighed Sir Gareth, in all that I may do. Then Sir Palamides rode off by himself, and thon in despite of Sir Tristram, he put himself in the thickest press amongst them of Orkney, and there he did so marvellous deeds of armies that all men had wonder of him, and for their meek none stond him a stroke. Then Sir Tristram saw Sir Palamides do such deed as he marvelled, and said to himself, Methinketh he is weary of my company. So Sir Tristram beheld him a great while, and did but little else, or the noise and cry was so great that Sir Tristram marvelled, from whence come the strength that Sir Palamides had there. On the one hand, methink he is weary of my company, is an unusually insightful comment from Sir Tristram. But at the same time, Carita, you're still right. Like, he still so doesn't get it. Right. Um, I wonder where he's getting his strength from. Gosh, that's amazing. Why is he... This is incredible, right? I have the faintest idea what's going on here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Deborah's asking... How can he recognize him? Palamides is wearing armor. I think they're still wearing their green, their matching green armor here at the beginning um, of this day. So he knows. It's like if you see somebody dress in their armor at the beginning of the day, you can still recognize him, uh, even once he puts his helmet on, um, until he changes his armor. Then all bets are off. Um, but, but that's a great question, Deborah. Um, one brief note before I forget about it. Um, the Orkney faction. Notice how the faction has grown, right? It's not just Gawain and his three brothers anymore, right? Um, or three of his brothers, I should say. We have now, there are all these Orkney cousins that are that are coming out of the woodwork, right? There's there's a whole bunch, there's, there's now a whole Orkney clan uh, that is down. And they, so notice two things. First, the Orkney Knights. We have these three factions, really, that keep conflicting here on the tournament field at Lona Zepp. You've got Lancelot and his kin, you've got the Orkney faction, and you have the four knights, right? Uh, Tristram, Palamides, Dinadin, and Gareth. Um, 
and things kind of shift about. But notice it's the Orkney faction who's fighting for King Arthur, right? Which, I don't know, makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Sir Palamides here. On the one hand, we can see he's not changed after yesterday, right? He has crossed an item off his bucket list, and it's a pretty major item, right? Win the prize at a tournament, win Lancelot, and Tristram were both in the field, right? Uh, that's a major bucket list item for Sir Palamides. Is he happier now? As he is his, you know, it is. Is, is he now going to be armed against his envy with the uh, satisfaction of that accomplishment? No. We see him still uh, competing with Tristram. He and Tristram have been on a team for the first day, right? And he, on Tristram's team, surpassed Tristram yesterday, right? Now he sets out aggressively to outdo Tristram from the beginning. Right by leading Tristram to think that he is um, uh, leading Tristram to think that he's not going to be doing much, right? Um, and then you know coming out of nowhere and doing all this stuff, and so Tristram was like, "Whoa, okay, he was lying to me." Right now, the lie that he told here doesn't seem to me like a big deal. Um, knights seem to lie all the time, especially when it comes to like sandbagging and disguising yourself seems to be totally okay. Like, think of the number of times that Tristram and Lancelot have, you know, disguised their identities, pretended to be someone that they weren't, right? Or I mean, that, that kind of thing seems to happen a lot, right? Um, you know, whether it's in order to give Sir Dinadin a hard time or whether it's to uh, conceal your identity from King Arthur for some reason, which is not always obvious. Um, anyway, so like, you know... On the one hand, I think that what Sir Dinadin does here in his competition, open competition with Sir Tristram on this first day, um, or no, or at the beginning of the second day, sorry, is what I mean. At the beginning of the day. On the one hand, it's fair. I think he's he's not done anything wrong. He's not acting unknightly yet. But we can see, and even Tristram can see, that Pelamides is targeting Tristram. Right. Um, so we can see on the one hand, he's not done anything wrong. He's done as a knight might do in order to put himself into a position to gain more worship. So, OK, that seems to be fine. Um, but it does show, uh, Dollar Stroke, I agree with you. Um, it does show that he's still being driven by his envy. And that's that is clearly his motivation here. Um we see him not just trying to win worship for himself, which is good. We see him trying to surpass the worship of Tristram. Um, it's when you're constantly looking out of the corner of your eye at the other guy and how well he's doing that you start. That's when you are you know you're doing something wrong, right? Okay. And then the real temptation comes. So Sir Tristram leaves, changes his armor, and comes back in disguise. Most of the field doesn't see this, right? Sir Tristram does it on the sly, and nobody else, even his other allies, don't know that he does this. And Lancelot, you'll remember, Lancelot is going to not know him, right? Lancelot is going to end up fighting against Sir Tristram, not recognizing that it was Sir Tristram. But Sir Palamides watches him go and watches him come back. And all of this aspired Sir Palamides, both the going and the coming, and so did La Belle Isode, for she knew Sir Tristram passing well. Uh, she has, apparently, they've moved past in their relationship where she couldn't recognize him even naked, uh, and now she can recognize him even when he's disguised in armor. This is a major accomplishment. Um, La Belle Isode is watching the whole thing, and she's keeping a close eye on Tristram, of course, right? So she sees this happening and Palamides also. Notice who are the two people who are most fixated on Sir Tristram, right? Uh, Sir Palamides and La Belle Isode. See, again, here we have a real love triangle, not just a, a Hollywood love triangle. Fond Sir Palamides saw that Sir Tristram was disguised and thought to sham him, 
And so he rode unto a knik that was sore wounded, that sate under a, th under a thorn a good way from the field. Sir Knik, sighed Sir Palamides, I pray you to lend me your armour and your shield, for mine is over well knowen in this field, and that hath done me great damage. And ye shall have mine armour and my shield, that it is, is as sure as yours. It's, don't worry, you're not downgrading or anything. I wol well, sighed the Knik, that ye have mine armour and also my shield. If they may do you any avile, I am well pleased. So Sir Palamides armed him hastily in that Knikta's armour and his shield that shone like any crystal or silver, and so he come riding into the field. And thon there was neither Sir Tristram, neither none of his party, neither of King Arthur's that knew Sir, P Sir Palamides. So Sir Palamides disguises himself, but you see the temptation, right? We can already see this. We, we can see how this is unfolding. We can see it's I love how, you know, sometimes, as I said before, we get a lot of the interiority of Palamides right here. We, we, we see um, uh, we're told what he is thinking. I also love the passages like this where we're not told what he's thinking, but we are shown clearly what he's thinking. Right. Um, Palamides sees his opportunity. Remember what was he fantasizing about the day before? If only I could fight against Sir Tristram and prove myself against him with La Belle Isode watching, right? That, but he can't because it would be unknightly. He came in with Sir Tristram. The four of them are like, the four of us will fight together at the Tournament of Lana Zepp. It would be treasonous for him just to turn and attack Tristram. When Tristram is counting, like he is Tristram's wingman in this tournament, right? Remember, that was the whole conversation that they were having. He's like, don't rely on me on, as your wingman today. I'm, I'm, whew, I'm all tuckered out, right? And so, remember, Tristram is like, okay, Gareth, you're my wingman, right? Um, <clears throat> that would be traitorous. And he doesn't do it. He doesn't turn on him. But here's an opportunity. And he has deniability and he sees it, right? Oh man, Tristram is in disguise. I know that it's him, but I could pretend that I don't and it's believable, right? Because no one else is going to recognize him because he's disguised, right? So if I disguise myself so that he doesn't recognize me, then I can fight against him without shame because I can, I can have deniability. I can pretend I didn't know who he was. And it's his fault. His Tristram's going off and changing and disguising himself, as Tristram so often does, um, gives him the opportunity, right? Provides this opening for Palamides to make his move. Um, now, Gerald, fighting in disguise in a tournament seems to be totally okay. Tristram and Lancelot both do this all the time. Um, uh, so th that's that's fine. It's in fact it's a it's it's a nightly thing to do, because then you're not resting on your reputation, right? If people know who you are, if people know that this is Sir Tristram and he's out there doing well, everyone's like, oh look, there's Sir Tristram doing well again. But if he looks like an unknown knight and people are like, oh wow, look, here's an unknown knight. He's doing amazing. Oh man, hooray! Let's give the prize to the unknown knight who beat everybody else. And then he's like, ta-da! It's Sir Tristram again. And everyone's like, oh, Sir Tristram, he did it again. Whereas again, see, it just it it's it's a way to establish, it's like re-winning your worship all over again, right? So it's cool. It's good. No problems. Um uh Jennifer, Palamides is disguising himself so that Tristram doesn't recognize him, right? Because if he just were to come in his own armor still, and again, I know you're in armor, so you're not recognizable, but he still, he was originally, before he swapped with the wounded knight, he was still in his green armor, right? Where like the four of them came in as like the four green amigos right at the beginning of this tournament. So Tristram would know that it was Palamides if he came after him. So he wants Tristram not to recognize him so that he can pretend not to rest recognize Tristram and the two of them can fight. And ideally, he's going to beat Sir Tristram and then they're both going to take their helmets off and can be like, oh, Sir Tristram. Oh, gosh, was that you I just defeated? Oh, my goodness. I didn't mean to humiliate you, but I totally did. Everybody saw that, right? I totally humiliated Sir Tristram. And it's me over here. Palmer. That's the fantasy, right? That's the thing that he... But he's lying. He knows it's Sir Tristram. 
he is, in fact, committing treason. But he knows he has the opportunity to deny it and nobody can prove it. He could get away. He could give in to his envy and go after Sir Tristram and get away with it. And seeing that opportunity, he gives in to the temptation and takes the opportunity. Um, and yeah, Stephen, people in the crowd um, uh, will often try to guess who the disguised knight might be. And often they have a shrewd guess as to who it is, right? Uh, and some Lancelot seems to be pretty good, actually, at recognizing uh, people. Unusually good at recognizing people. Um, yeah. Now, Gerald, I agree. This is, so far, it is less bad than killing the horse. I agree. It's not an, a, a positive, unknightly act in that way. But he's still acting against, he's breaking his, you know, oath to Sir Tristram that the two of them would be fighting together in this tournament. Um They made a pact going in together. So he's switching sides on Sir Tristram, which is a squirrely thing to do. He's breaking his oath. So is it? it's it's not the same kind of unknightly act as the horse decapitation was um, against Sir Lancelot the day before. But in, one, in, in a different way, this is more... I mean, this is a little bit more premeditated, right? He is creating a situation where he can indulge a desire which is not a good desire, right? Um, but uh, which, where he thinks he can get away with it. And of course, the problem is going to come in, as it always does, in the cover-up, right? So after this day, Tristram wins the prize this day anyway. And, uh, but Sir Palamides gets Tristram into trouble. Sir Palamides goes after Tristram, right? And they're fighting toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And then Lancelot comes in. And Lancelot attacks Tristram, and, and Palamides is just waiting. And then as soon as Lancelot stops attacking Tristram, Palamides comes back after him, right? Um, so Tristram is in a serious amount of danger here. Now, Tristram is partially in danger because of his own stupid fault. If he hadn't changed his armor, then Sir Lancelot would have attacked him, right? But any of that's the risk you do when you play the, you know, stranger knight winning his own worship again card, like Tristram so often does. Um... Okay. Afterwards, Sir Palamides, still in his strange armor, with his helmet on, leaves the field with the rest of the party, with Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadin and Sir Gareth, right? And Sir Tristram is not pleased, right? Um, and he's like, dude, who invited you, right? Nobody wants you, you jerk. You were attacking me all day. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we really don't want you here. Right. And then Sir Palamides is like, oh, but I like to be with you more than anybody else. Right. And when he talks, they recognize him. So by his line gauge, Sir Tristram knew that it was Sir Palamides and said, ah, sir, are ye such a knight? Ye have been named wrong, for ye have been ever called a gentle knight, and as this die ye have showed me great ungentleness, for ye had almost brought me to my death. But as for you, I suppose I should have done well enough, but Sir Launcelot was with you, but Sir Launcelot with you was over much, for I can know no knight living, but Sir Launcelot is too over good for him that he will do his utterest. And he will do his utterest. Boy, sorry, I butchered that paragraph. Alas, said Sir Palamides, are ye my lord Sir Tristram? Yea, sir, and that ye know well enow. Be my knighthood, said Sir Palamides, until now I knew you not, for I went ye had been the king of Ireland, for well I wot that ye bar his armies. Deniability. I bar his armies, sighed Sir Tristram, and that wall I abide by, for I won them on us in a field of a full noble knight whose name was Sir Marhalt, and with great pine I won that knight, for there was none other recover. But Sir Marhalt died through false leeches, and yet was he never yolden to me. False leeches? What, it's the doctor's fault they couldn't cure sword through the brain? Whatever. Sir, said Sir Palamides, I went that ye had been turned upon Sir Launcelot's party, and that caused me to turn. Ye say well, said Sir Tristram, and so I talk you, forgive you. Okay. Sir Tristram forgives him. 
So Tristram believes it. He, again, full deniability. Even now he's playing dumb. Oh, Sir Tristram, is that you? Oh, don't I feel embarrassed, right? Oh, egg all over my face. You were that one. You're that strange knight I've been attacking so hard all day. Oh, man, if only I'd known. Now you see how unknightly this is, right? Um, he is being false. He is being treasonous. He is... He... he was acting falsely and is now swearing falsely in order to cover it up, right? To maintain. But you notice along the way here, notice how he, he went a step further. What he was fantasizing about on the first day was an opportunity with his worship to meet Tristram in the field and overcome him and prove once and for all that in the end he is a better knight or at least as good as Sir Tristram, right? Um... What he does this day is not only dishonest, it's not only backhanded, um, but it's also deadly. He gives, he does create this situation where he almost kills Tristram at an unfair advantage because of how Sir Lancelot comes in totally ignorantly, right? Not knowing that it's Tristram. And he takes advantage of that situation to try to one-up the thing and actually kill uh, Sir Tristram. Sir Tristram believes himself to be in mortal peril, and as we will soon see, he is not the only one who has that opinion. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, again, we can see. Uh, we know for a fact, and again, notice this is something, again, I've talked about how we can see Sir Mallory's skill uh, as a, as a uh, uh, storyteller improving over the way the narrator or somebody would have had to explain this to us we, like would have taken a time out and explained what was really going on notice how much subtler Mallory has become now right um, how he allows this this stuff to happen without rubbing our faces in it um, we can see we we know exactly how guilty he is and we see him get guiltier and guiltier the more he continues to lie to cover up uh, the false choice that he has made. Um, but Juan La Belizeau saw Sir Palamides, she challenged then her colors, for wrath she meek not speak. Anon Sir Tristram espied her countenance and sighed, Madam, for what cows make ye all such cheer? We have been sore travailed all this day. Mine own lord, sighs la, la belle Isode, for God is sack, be ye not displeased with me, for I may none otherwise do. I saw this day how ye were betrayed, and nigh brought unto your death. Truly, sir, I saw every deal, how and in what wise. And therefore, sir, how should I suffer in your presence such a felon and traitor as is Sir Palamides? For I saw him with mine, Ian, how he beheld you when you went out of the field. For ever he hoved still upon his horse, till that he saw you come againward. And then, forthwithal, I saw him ride to the hurt knicked, and challenged his harness with him, and then straight I saw you he encountered with you. I saw how he encountered with you, and willfully Sir Palamides did battle with you. And as for him, sir, I was not greatly afeard, but I drad sore Sir Launcelot, which knew not you. Madam, said Sir Palamides, ye may say what ye will, I may not contrary you, but be mean knichthood, I knew not, my lord Sir Tristram. Lies. No force, sighed Sir Tristram unto Sir Palamides. I will talk your excuse. But well I wot ye sparred me but a little, but no force. All is pardoned on my party. Van la Belizode hilled down her head and sighed no more at that time. But she is obviously not convinced uh, being able to tell a hawk from a handsaw. She saw everything, right? Um... And she knows how, but remember the significance of this, right? How by the end of the second day, that beautiful moment on the field on the first day has completely and permanently crashed down around poor Sir Palamides, right? 
having given in to this very strong temptation to seize this opportunity to match himself against Tristram and prove to himself once and for all that he is a better knight than Sir Tristram, he has done such that now he is being condemned as a felon and traitor by the woman he loves and whose happiness inspired him. Remember the significance of her countenance here, right? That countenance, that happy laughing countenance that she was directing down towards the field that inspired him yesterday has now turned into the heavy and angry countenance that she is in fact directing at his at him personally right no fantasies are able to be maintained in the face of this she is not into you palamides and if ever there was a chance that you were going to you know get her to at least look more kindly on you in some way even though there is no chance for reciprocity of your love but still there something maybe in some sense could have happened but now um it is uh it's over right um yes deborah and he lies to her face right i mean the shame of it the shame of it um to maintain because he's stuck now he has to maintain the lie right he maintains the lie to the face of his lady and is thus completely shamed in his own in her in her eyes because she knows and he knows she knows right and he knows that she knows that he's lying to her face right he is completely shamed even though sir tristram is still there like it's okay everything's fine cheer up is old right we're like uh, everything's I, i i forgive him and it's fine no force um, yeah, he tried too hard and ruined it for himself. Carita, exactly. So, so sad. Notwithstanding. Uh, so, okay, so this is on the third day. On the third day, things shift around, and King Arthur's side is now the underdogs, clearly, right? And only Sir Lancelot and his kin. I don't know what happened to the Orkney boys. I think they've retired, right? So the Orkney boys, uh, and by the way, I agree. Some of you were talking about this earlier. I, too, in my head, could not help but call them the Orkish Knights. Um, anyway, the Orkish Knights seem to have all, uh, they're, they're not, they're, 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 they're done. You know, stick a fork in the Orkish Knights. They've had enough of a beating at the hands of Palamides and Sir Tristram on days one and two. Um, so King Arthur's side is now down to only Lancelot and his kin, basically. And they are now very heavily outnumbered. Notwithstanding, the other party held them so fast to get her that King Arthur and his Canictes were overmatched. And when Sir Tristram saw that, what labor King Arthur and his Canictus, and in especial the great noble deeds that Sir Launcelot did with his own hondas, then Sir Tristram called unto him Sir Palamides, Sir Gareth, and Sir Dinadan, and sighed thus to them, My fire fellows, wit you well that I will turn unto King Arthur's party, for I saw never so few men do so well. And it would be sham unto us that been Canictus of the Round Table to see our lord King Arthur and that noble Canic Sir Launcelot to be dishonoured. Sir, it will be well do, said Sir Gareth and Sir Dinadin. Sir, do your best, said Sir Palamides, for I will not challenge my party that I come in withal. That is for envy of me, said Sir Tristram, but God speed you well in your journey. By the way, I find journey a very telling word there, right? Uh, you are journeying down a road here, Palamides, and our paths have parted, right? Um, uh, he's, you know, I, I, I guess I'm going to have to say farewell to you, Palamides, because you've chosen, right? And you've chosen to separate from me. Um, notice again, Sir Palamides has uh, deniability again, right? He has a justification, which is a totally plausible sounding justification, Right? Uh, no, I'm not going to turn. So now nobody could accuse him of being a, a, a felon or a traitor, right? He's not flipping sides and in order to oppose Sir, Sir Tristram like he kind of did, 
yesterday. It sort of it wasn't exactly flipping sides, but again, taking the opportunity to fight against uh, Tristram personally. Um, he can say, because it's defensible, right? His argument to say, no, 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 I started on this side. I'm not going to switch sides. That's defensible. But Tristram is echoing the same argument that Palamides himself gave before day one. Remember when he was the one who set the tone at the very beginning, very nightly and very correctly? Tristram is now doing the same thing again, and Palamides is resisting that. And Tristram here, you know, Captain Clueless is correct here, right? It is for envy of Tristram, and even Tristram can see it, right? You say you don't want to switch sides because you want to do the right thing and stay on the side that you started with, but I can see the truth. You just want the excuse to be on the opposite side from me so that you can fight me. Dever says that's the most insightful thing Tristram has ever said. It might be. It's up there. Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... This decision is the choosing of sides becomes symbolically important here, too. Right? It becomes sort of expanded symbolically. And everybody agrees. Although he might have clung to some sort of to, to, to that sort of excuse to, to stay on his original side, which has the sort of veneer of being a knightly decision, nobody is fooled. Right. Maybe that's why even Tristram can see it, because everybody can see it. Right. Um, and everybody blames him for not sticking with the people that he came in with and for choosing to be on the opposite side from them. Um, and he ends up leaving the field on the third day. Oh, the crash back down from his greatest glory on day one to now his greatest public humiliation here on day three. Um, and he when he leaves and he's out in the out by a well uh, wailing, weeping and wailing and, uh, uh, and carrying on like a woodman, right? Fana Sir Palamides was at the well wailing and weeping. There come fleeing the king of Wallace and of Scotland, and they saw Sir Palamides in that raj. Alas, said they, so noble a man as ye should be in this array. And Than the king got Sir Palamides' horse again, and mod him to arm him and mount upon his horse again, and so he rode with them, mocking great dole. So when Sir Palamides come nigh Sir Tristram and La Belle Isode pavilions, then Sir Palamides, remember his own, his team, right, where he was staying at the beginning of the tournament? And when he come to the port, sorry, uh, right, he pried the two, two king is to abide him, there the while that he spoke with Sir Tristram. He can't let it go. And when he come to the port of the pavilion, Sir Palamides said on high, Where art thou, Sir Tristram de Lyoness? Sir, said Sir Dinadan, that is Sir Palamides. What, Sir Palamides? Will ye not come near among us? Says Tristram. Notice Tristram's like, he doesn't understand that anything's wrong, right? Back to Captain Clueless again. But also... It's not that I don't want to just take this as, as Tristram's cluelessness. This is also, I think, his good heartedness. He knows. He knows that Palamides is envious. He knows that Palamides is gunning for him. He knows that Palamides can't let this go. But he forgives him, right? Notice his, like, yes, Palamides left them. Pal Everyone is like, oh, Palamides, that was so bad. Like, you, you'd. You know, just for the sake of fighting against Tristram, you left the knight you came in with. Bad job. Badly done, Palamides. Um, but Sir Tristram's response, he's like, he doesn't, it shouldn't change anything, right? He still accepts Palamides. He's still expecting Palamides to come stay with him, right? He's like, hey, we saved you a seat, Palamides, right? Fie on thee, traitor, said Sir Palamides, for with thee well, and it were daylight as it is nicht, I should slay thee mine own handes, and if ever I may get thee, said Sir Palamides, thou shalt die for this dire's deed. Sir Palamides, said Sir Tristram, ye, mit, ye wit me with wrong, for had ye done as I did, you should have had worship. But sithen ye give me so large warning, I shall be well ware of you. 
Fie on thee, traitor, said Sir Palamides, and therewithal he departed. Um, Sir Palamides, I, I, the, I couldn't think of anything but that line which I put as the, the subtitle of this, uh, of this slide, that line from, um, uh, from Tolkien, right, where he talks about the shame and the anger of the shame, right? Um, people who feel ashamed for what they've done get angry very easily. This is this particular depiction of Sir Palamides. Sir Palamides seems completely, um, you know, off the deep end here, right? Um, and yet, I think this is one of the most psychologically insightful moments of Sir Palamides' entire story, right? That Sir Palamides would just hurl totally irrational accusations at Sir Tristram, accusing him, Sir Tristram, of betraying Palamides, right? Um, when he has just offered him a welcome, hey, you know, why not? Will you not come near? Are you not going to come in? Right? Come on, Palamides. We're waiting for you. And he just starts shouting completely incoherent, um, raging at him because he is so angry, because he is so ashamed of his own. He knows. He knows better than anybody else that his own actions led to his fall from grace here. He had things... Things were going great on that first day, not without foreboding of what was to come, right? The horse decapitation was was a sign of the path that Palamides was still walking down, right? But he walked down it with both of his eyes open, and we saw him give in to temptation repeatedly, the same temptation, right? To try to appear to do the right thing, to be able to both indulge his envy and yet still maintain his worship in the eyes of everybody else, which is, that's a fantasy. It's, an, it's a bad fantasy, right? But it's equally fantastic as anything, uh, any other f more positive fantasies that he might have indulged. And he has done this to him, and he knows he's done this to himself. That's why he's so angry at Tristram. What does he have left? All he has left is that anger, that envy, which led him down this path in the first place. And he's just letting it, you know, letting it uh, 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 come bursting out, right? Um, and therewithal he departed. Yeah. <laughs> Insert cry emoji, says Deborah. I agree. This is incredibly sad. Uh, incredibly sad. Um, uh, and Gerald, I agree. Tristram's final response is still pretty good-natured. Here I do think that we're seeing Tristram's cluelessness again. He doesn't get this, the fullness of what's going on here. He's like, whoa, you know, oh, Sir Palamides is off his meds here today. Uh, get, okay, Sir Palamides. On the one hand, Sir Tristram's been through this before, right? How many times has Sir Palamides sworn vengeance against, Trist against Sir Tristram and said that he would kill him the next time he saw him, right? Um, you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, goodbye, Sir Tristram, and I'll most likely kill you the next time I see you, right? I mean, like, he... So one could forgive Sir Tristram for being slightly blasé about the death threats from Sir Palamides. Um, but at the same time, I think that... Um, uh, at the same time, I think that he's missing... This, uh, this is not the same as the other times, right? Um, the tournament at Lana Zepp is a bigger deal in the moral story of Sir Palamides... Uh, than the early earlier issues uh, have been. And Marilyn, I think you're right. Tristram may never have felt this degree of shame. Um, I think that's not, that's not say as I think Karina would be quick to point out, perhaps it would have been good for him if he had, uh, and he has had occasion on which he should perhaps have felt more shame than he has. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I think that you're right. And, uh, you know, uh, Dolly, I think that's a really interesting suggestion. Uh, Lancelot should have been sterner. He should not have indulged Palamides, he says. 
tough, tough but fair, right? Tough but fair. Um, uh, yeah. Um, had remember what I was saying before about you know somebody who was just one step more humble and more contrite than Palamides was. Again, I believe his contrition was sincere uh, in his conversation with Lancelot there on the field on the first day. But had he been one step more sincere, one step more repentant, one step more humble, he would have taken the the consequences of his action and not the fact that he was trying to avoid those consequences and still hold on to the worship that he had come so close to winning was a bad sign, right? Um, and if he had not been allowed to get away with it, his unknightly deed on the day one, right? Maybe he would not have fallen into the two temptations that he faced and failed uh, to overcome on the next two days. Um, yeah, spare the rod and and uh, uh, and, <laughs> and 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 uh, spoil the second fiddle night. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Karina, I'm just totally putting words in your mouth now. Yeah, that's exactly it. I, I'm just anticipating, uh, you know, and whenever I, and, and Karina, it's true. Like, you've been very consistent in your reading of Tristram, and I find your reading of Tristram pretty compelling. Uh, so, yeah, now when I'm, I'm reading Tristram, I'm like, what well, What would Karina say? Uh, that's exactly it. Um, and uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, okay. And it's true, Carita, maybe success wasn't good for Palamides. And again, I think that that's, um, I think that this, I would count that as yet another really sharp moral insight by Sir Thomas Mallory here, right? Envious people might feel, genuinely believe, if only I could do that thing, right? If only I could have that thing, then everything would be okay, right? Then I'd be fine. Like, I know that maybe I'm a little obsessed, right? Maybe my rivalry with this person that I can never do better than is a little bit inappropriate. Maybe, you know, but, you know, it's just, if one time, if I could beat him one time, then I'd be fine, right? I'd, but if I could only just, but I never get the recognition I deserve, I could, I, 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 right? But the, but the fact is, it's not true. Have you ever known anybody who was like that? Anyone who had that kind of a pattern of envy, who just got over it when they finally won, right? It, it almost never happens, right? Once you get into that kind of mindset, you know, it, 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 indulging that mindset is not the way out of it, right? Uh, and I think in that sense, yeah, I think that we can say Palamides um, winning w on the first day, on the one hand, high point of, of Palamides' career, but not good, you know, and I think not really good for him. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, good. Okay, well, let's stop there. We're not quite done with the story of Sir Palamides. We'll, uh, we'll finish that up. Um, He's still got to be sentenced to death and rescued by guess who and um, or guess who and also guess who. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll sort of and, and then the, the confrontation, the final confrontation between Lancelot or between Tristram and uh, uh, and Palamides. Um, anyway, yeah, Karina, that's what's so compelling about this, isn't it? Uh, the way in which Sir Palamides is morally culpable. Right. And like when you watch him march out of from this scene, right, he's he's got nobody to blame but himself. And this is absolutely his fault. And we have seen every step that has led to this. Right. It is absolutely his fault. He is reaping what he sowed. And yet, wow, do you feel for him? Right. This is a tragedy. Right. This, this Palamides is a tragic figure. And it's you, you, you know, you don't just look down on him. Right. I mean. We don't feel for Palamides what we feel for Gawain, 
right? And yet Palamides is culpable, not of the same things as Gawain. I'm not exactly trying to compare them, but again, but the point is, he's not just a villain, right? Uh, it is such a wonderful depiction of, you know, a a person who's really struggling morally, right? What a wonderful job he does. Um, just amazing. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll leave it there. We'll come back. We'll finish up a little bit more of Palamides and Tristram for next time. Then we'll say goodbye to Sir Palamides and Tristram. We are coming. We're going to go through the end. So we've got what is uh, what is listed as the uh, the 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 story of um, uh, uh, of uh, Lancelot and Elaine uh, for next time. Uh, so we'll we'll definitely want to talk about that. that's a really, really important story. Um, but um Remember, and as we get into there, remember what I was saying before about how I felt, especially at the beginning, the story of Tristram and Isolde, the love story of Tristram and Isolde, seemed to be setting up um, to sort of establishing in advanced parallels, right, to kind of uh, guide uh, our, you know, remember I kept saying this is going to come back to be important later. Um, we're... Uh, this is where we're going to start seeing that, right? So the real drama of Lancelot and Guinevere is going to begin uh, starting uh, with that last section of this book. Um, so we're going to go through. So the goal is for next class, we're going to get up to, but not including the beginning of the quest for the Holy Grail. Uh, and then we will come back to the Sangreal starting the following week. So thanks everybody for joining me. Uh, hopefully I'll see a couple of you uh, uh, in Texas, uh, in Waco in a couple days. Uh, and for the rest of you, I will see you guys next week. Thanks everybody. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.